Hello, hello, and welcome to City Space, and this is what makes Boston home, a celebration of our beloved city, presented by Cognoscenti, which is WBUR's home for ideas and opinion, led by the incomparable Chloe Axelson. You're going to meet her a little later on. I, did we want to applaud for Chloe? Let's <laughs> applaud for Chloe. Um, I am Margaret Lowe, I'm WBUR CEO, and I am so happy to see all of you tonight. I actually grew up a few miles here from here, so Boston is my home. My ultimate claim to fame is that the car guys, Tom and Ray Maiazzi, were actually my dad's mechanics. <laughs> and not only were they hilarious on the radio, um, they were actually really good mechanics too. So in any case, I left home at the age of 17 to go to college, and over the years I came back. It was once in a while I came back for holidays and to see my family on the Cape. My mom and dad, who are both gone now, used to always say, everybody else's kids come to Boston and our kids leave. And it was, it was a mostly loving child. I spent most of my adult life at NPR and then the Atlantic, and over the years I was in San Francisco, I was in Washington, D.C., New York City, and I was lured back to Boston to lead this wonderful organization. I'm not going to admit here the number of decades that were in between. So I returned to Boston in January of 2020, and it was a real homecoming. I walked into my office right upstairs on my first day, and there were handwritten letters sitting on my desk waiting for me from old friends, um, from friends of my parents who'd heard or read that I was coming home. And my parents would have been overjoyed to know that I'd come back to the city that they loved. And my big sister, Julie, always says to me, Marg, they know. So there's something very powerful about living in a place where you grew up. It's the deep familiarity. For me, it's the sweet smells of New England in springtime, the flowers of childhood, daffodils, and forsythia and azalea. It's snow-covered streets in winter. It's actually having to wear boots and hats and mittens. I even love, and this is true, I even love cleaning snow and ice off my car. I love Boston accents. I love that everyone roots for the Red Sox and the fact that so many people here have devoted their lives to making this world a better place in one way or another. And this town isn't about power. It's not about who you know or the latest fashion. That may be an understatement. In Boston, people are tuned into the wider world, and they love WBUR, and WBUR loves this city right back. With that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Vicki Spruill. She's president and CEO of the New England Aquarium, a research and conservation organization that has protected and cared for the ocean and marine mammals for more than half a century. Talk about making the world a better place. Add to that, the aquarium is the premier sponsor of this gathering, and we are oh so grateful. Vicki, the floor is yours. I am so delighted to be here. Thank you, Margaret. We are so lucky to have you back in Boston. I appreciate this opportunity to join you all today. Um, the New England Aquarium is so proud of our presence in the community and so proud to support these kinds of conversations with WBUR at City Space. This is an amazing venue because we ho they host, we host conversations that bring people together and really elevate our shared experiences. The aquarium holds a special place in many New Englanders' hearts. I have to ask, how many of you have visited the New England Aquarium in your lifetimes? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> That's that's the most favorite part of my job because I always get every hand up. Um, it's, you know, it's an affection that was seeded early, often on a school field trip, and then nurtured with visits with family and friends, and so much feels like home to so many people. But we want it to feel like home to everyone, that it and Central Wharf, on which we are located, is welcoming and inclusive. As part of these efforts, we're delighted to host Boston Public School children and their families for free through the BPS Sundays program. And it has been a huge hit. And to hear the stories from the families that come on those days is, is heartwarming and hopeful. 
We're also excited to host World Oceans Day. Uh, that's celebrated on June 1, in case you didn't know, and all of you are invited to uh, welcome to come on our plaza. We also want to help prepare the entire downtown waterfront for the from the impacts of climate change, like a warming ocean and rising sea level. We see it firsthand every day with surging seas right at our doorstep. And how climate change is affecting coastal cities like ours is a serious conversation. It's affecting ocean animals because temperatures are warming. It's affecting their habitats. And many people don't know that we have a dedicated research arm at the New England Aquarium called the Anderson Cabot Center for Ocean Life. And more than 40 researchers who use science to protect animals in the ocean. And they're helping others use the ocean responsibly. So if you leave thinking one thing about the New England Aquarium, it's more than the main building on Central Wharf. We do that because just like Boston is our home, Earth, which should have been called ocean, covering 70% of the planet, um, is also our home. A habitable planet needs a healthy ocean, and a healthy ocean needs all of us. So folks, you are in for a real treat with an incredible lineup here this evening, and the New England Aquarium is so very honored and proud to support this event. I'll pass the baton back to Margaret and turn the page for her, except my tab came off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now that's preparation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vicki. We're so grateful to you, to the New England Aquarium for helping to make Boston home for marine mammals and wonderful humans alike. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. It's the opening line of an essay by the late great journalist and writer Joan Didion. And that's our job at WBUR2, to tell stories that help us understand our world, to help us understand this town, and that's what really fuels Cognoscenti, too. That's the team behind tonight's gathering. And our Cog editors know really better than anyone that stories are what tether us together and remind us of our shared humanity. With that, please welcome the peerless Tiziana Deering, host of Radio Boston, to lead us through this evening. Tiziana. Great to be with you. I'm so excited uh, for the stories that our guests are going to share. Before we start, I want you to just take a second, and I want you to close your eyes for just a second. And you can define Boston any way you want, but I want you to go in your mind to that corner of Boston that feels like it's secretly and specially yours. And I want you to think, what does it smell like? What does it feel like on your skin? What sounds are you hearing? If you're eating or there's food, what does it taste like? How does it make your heart feel? And now I want you to pretend that in a moment the universe claps its hands and now you're in someone else's space. Okay, open your eyes. That's what we mean when we say home. And tonight, our guests are going to invite you into their spaces, into what makes Boston home for them. And throughout the evening, you've shared some moments when Boston felt like home to you. And I'll read some of those. I love them. I can't wait. I hope you get, have time to read all of them. But tonight is a celebration of what home is to us and why this city and this region has the magic to make itself home to our wonderful and diverse community. And so now, cried Max, let the wild rumpus start. <laughs> so our first guest uh, is Anita Diamond, uh, a journalist and novelist. She's written for The Globe and The Phoenix, is a longtime contributor to Cognoscenti. She's a big Sox fan. Uh, she's called Boston home for nearly 50 years. Welcome, Anita. Thank you. It's great to have you. I gotta say, I'm very excited to be interviewed by you. Oh, because this is one of the premier. I've never heard a better interviewer. Well, on thank radio. you. Don't you agree? Thank you. What a treat. Okay, I have to reclose my eyes okay. because now this feels like home. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, and we're going to start with a picture, actually. And the last time I was on this stage and spoke with somebody about a picture of family, it was actually Henry Louis Gates. And he was talking about his program uh, and how important his television program and how important it is to know where you came from. And your story of home starts with these two people in their search from home. So tell us. Oh, these are my parents on the boat from Europe after the war to, to New York, where they, they first landed. Um, they survived the war in Europe. They uh, avoided the concentration camps. They met in Switzerland, uh, where they were both in internment camps. They got married in Italy. My father would have stayed in Italy forever, but there was no work. Um, so they came to the United States. They got a sponsor who, <laughs> that at the minute they landed, had nothing to do with them. So they were pretty much on their own. And they, um, they made a home. I was born in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, we lived in Newark, New Jersey uh, for <clears throat> my childhood until I was about 12. <clears throat> and then we moved to Denver, Colorado. So my, you know, my journey continues <laughs> west from their homes. My father was born in Germany. My mother was actually born in Poland and grew up in Paris. So um, it's just a long journey. And um, I don't think they ever felt completely at home. Why? Uh, because this wasn't the place they were born. It wasn't, I remember my mother complaining about bread and butter uh, and how bad it was here. <laughs> so we finally caught up. We did finally catch up. But, but I, all through my childhood, you know, bread was called vata, which means cotton. And so, uh, so yeah. So they, were, I mean, always felt themselves to be um, newcomers to some extent. My father more comfortably than my mother. So it's interesting because Boston really feels like home to you. Yes. You weren't born here. No, no. But I've lived. I've lived here most of my life. Um, it's a you know, it's a chosen home, and over the years, I found more and more reasons to love it. It's a place I found my career, where I found my husband, where I had a child and raised her here, where I learned to love the ocean, which was, I grew up in Denver to some extent, so the mountains were where we went, but um, it took me a while to fall in love with the ocean, but I did, and um, yeah, so it's given me everything. It's given me my career, my life, my family, my friends, um, and a sense of belonging. So that's, that's what I wondered. Because when I read uh, an essay that you wrote for Cognoscenti about Boston being home, I thought, all right, so what is home then? What is home? Well, actually, when you asked us to think of a place, um, I thought of the Charles River. And, uh, Let's bring up that picture. Um, <laughs> oh, no. We won't leave it up for long. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave it up. Um, we'll take it back down now. Okay. <laughs> that is me. My daughter took that picture. Um, and that was a picture of you jumping, jumping in a bathing suit the, into the Charles several River. Several years ago, the Charles River Conservancy um, had a day where you could sign up in advance and do that. And it was a lot of fun uh, floating in the middle of the city and looking up. It's, it's quite, quite an adventure to do that. So the Charles is, um, you know, I think it... It's like a river that reflects uh, the, the light wherever you are in a city. And I think many, most maybe great cities have rivers in them. It's like the, the artery, the heart of a city. And wherever you are, it's beautiful. And every season, it's beautiful. And it shows you something different about nature and about what people next to it are doing and boats on it and birds on it. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, it's, for me, it's water. It's the river. It's interesting, when you talked about uh, the city gave you your career, it gave you your husband, mm -hmm. um, it strikes me, I don't tend to think about home as a place that gives me things. And yet, um, home is the base from which we are free to be mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and develop and fly or escape or hide. <laughs> and all of those things are a gift. Mm -hmm. What was the first gift you recognized Boston gave you that kind of made it home? The first thing that popped into my head, this is a long time ago, was movie theaters. Um, I did not Orson see that Wells, coming. Orson Welles in Cambridge. And you know, first, we still have the, um, the Coolidge in Brookline, but it, there, were, there, were, there were movies to be seen, and uh, European foreign movies as well as first-run movies, and 
you know, as I grew to more and more comfortable, the museums became part of my uh, orbit too. And, and the, the waterfront, you know, when people come to visit me, we do a walk. We start um, at the ICA and we walk all the way around to the North End and eat. Um, so, and, and I love walking that. It changes every year and past the aquarium, of course. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, you know, so I love showing it off. And, you know, thinking about my parents and my, they never lived anywhere for 50 years. But I, I'm here for 50 years and I have no desire to go anywhere else. So I think that's in, in a way a reaction to that. Um, so I landed here and stayed. Roots. How did they visit you here? Hmm? Do your oh, parents? Yeah. And my, actually, after my dad died, my mother lived here for a while. She was never comfortable here. Why? That's just who she was, as my friends know. That's just who she was. So that's interesting, too. Is there a place in the world she could have ever felt was home? Not given her, no, not given what happened to her, being chased out of Paris by the Nazis and escaping into Switzerland. I mean, the world was a very unsafe and dangerous place, and people were not to be trusted. Yeah. And I wonder, then, in Boston's narrative and Boston's history, we feel safer for some people than others. Yes, we have absolutely. Safer for some people than others. What is the mission of our city to be a home for mm. all who Everybody. we are now? That is that is the mission, isn't it? To be safe and full of opportunity for everybody, regardless of where they where they started. Um, and you know how they got to be here, if they've been here for many generations, or they just got here from Haiti. Um, it, we have to be open to everybody, and we will all be better for it. The music is better, the food is better, the conversations are better. Uh, yeah. Is there any place you haven't seen, thing you haven't done, uh, taste you haven't tasted, uh, smell you haven't smelled that you still, after almost 50 years in Boston, is still on the list. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's so much I haven't tasted. I haven't been there. Are so many new restaurants, for example. Um, yeah, and there are walks I need to take that I have ta haven't taken and want, have planned to take. Um, I'm getting better at walking the Emerald Necklace. I think I've done almost all of it, uh, and that so that's on my list. Um, and again, this summer, I just have to say, I just love the um, the watershed on the harbor from the ICA to go back and forth. And that's, I mean, there's, there's a, uh, an old, actually the ICA is a great example of how Boston's changed and grows because it didn't exist before. It was actually one hard ass woman who insisted that we have this happening there. And now there's this, they bought a building on the other side of the river, of the side of the harbor, and you can go back and forth and you see the, you see the city all around you and you're going from art to art um, to a place to have a uh, pie. <laughs> and uh, so it, you know, it's, it's, and every season is different. In our last minute, uh, you write, if you were going to write a character that was Boston, tell me a little bit about who that character would be. Uh, I know. There are too many. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that very no, often. No. Just I ask a question and the guest no. is like, there's no. not one person. No, it's it's would be, you know, multi one of those sort of a head on, on on each aspect. No, it's it's diversity. It's uh, and it's an it's a history that goes back to um, to the Massachusetts people and to the latest immigrants to the city who will add their add their flavor to it. So not one. So it would have to be some kind of sci-fi multi no, 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 no. constantly it would be a, it changing. It would be a diorama. There we go. Anita Diamond, thank you thank for you. sharing your sense of Boston and why it's your home with us. My pleasure. Thank pleasure you, to talk so with you. We're going to do a couple of uh, notes from you uh, on when did Boston feel like home to you. When I was at the Copley Square Farmer's Market on June 26, 2015, and suddenly the bell started ringing at the Old South Church to celebrate the US Supreme Court's decision to legalize same-sex marriage. In 1999, yeah, go for it. <laughs> In 1999, I joined the Women's Flag Football League we practiced at Carter Field near Northeastern. I'd look up at the buildings and think, where else can I do this? <laughs> I love that. 
And I, this one, we had, we had a couple of shout outs to Storm of 78, by the way, so I'm gonna pick one, but there were more than one shout out to the Storm of 78. When I realized I could walk all over Boston and Cambridge during the Storm of 78. And whoever you are, I think we should give you an extra nod for the fact that you walked all over Boston and Cambridge during the Storm of 78. I secretly think it might have been you, Anita. <laughs> but that's fantastic. Are you ready for another? I am too. I am too. So let's bring up Dr. Jim O'Connell. Dr. Jim O'Connell is the president of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Program. It began in 1985 as a tiny pilot, and it now provides care to some 10,000 to 11,000 homeless individuals in Boston each year. Welcome to the stage. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. So we're going to start with a picture with you, too. Do I have to look at it? Or? Well, you do. <laughs> but you can see the version here if you want. And here you are treating uh, a patient. Um, and I, I don't know, with all the patients you've treated, could, do you remember this patient, or does it evoke a set of memories for you? What do you think of when you see this picture? Well, the first thing I think of is how awful the years have been to me. <laughs> this, <laughs> the, the, you were younger. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and admit that. A little that. bit younger. But no, I remember he, I, I knew that man for many, many years. He was a great patient of ours. Could tell you all about him, but I'll leave yeah. that. Tell but, me one thing. <clears throat> he, um, he was a man who had been homeless for a long time, who told us a name that we realized after he died was not his name, so we've never been able to connect him to um, who his family was, so we kind of were his family. But what I remember most about him, he had, had a terrible lung infection one time and ended up with what's called an empyema in his right lung. And then when you're a medical student, finding doing a physical exam to let you know what an empyema was is really important. And he let just about every BU and Harvard medical student listen to his lungs and learn what an empyema was. <laughs> so you know it's interesting because that was the last that was the last thing I was going to talk to you about. But instead, we'll make it the first thing, which is the reciprocity of what you've done over the years. Right, so we're, we're seeing you treat him, and we have this conversation. You, di you didn't think at first that this is what you were gonna do in medicine, did you, when you very mm -hmm. first started out? Uh, you know, absolutely not. <laughs> so my life has been marked by an awful lot of serendipity that we don't have to go, but that was not my goal at all. And how did you start here? Remind us. I, you know, I literally, you probably, I literally got told to do it. I was finishing my residency, wanted to become an oncologist, um, and was going to a fellowship in Boston, got a grant. The Mayor Flynn got a grant from the Robert Johnson Foundation to try to get health care out to homeless people before they came to the emergency room. And the homeless people, who to this day are on our boards of, board of directors, insisted that we have full-time doctors. They couldn't find one, so I got called into my chief's office, which... For those of you who are in medicine, know that's like getting called into the principal's office. And um, he asked me if I would delay my, if he could delay my fellowship for a year, if I would do this for a year. So being a child of the '60s, feeling I had a lot to give back that I hadn't done yet, I said I'd do it for a year. In we frame so often mm. the work that you do, and, and, and as you know, you're serving the poor, you're serving the homeless, you're serving the marginalized. What strikes me about the story you told me about that first man that we saw, how many of us, empowered or disempowered, enfranchised or disenfranchised, would allow people to touch us, explore our illnesses uh, as a gift of learning to them? So I want to jump to the third picture, if we can. And the reason that this third picture struck me was the, the, the mutuality of it. And I kept thinking as I read your story and your interview, and I've known your work you know, for 20 years. Um, have you been given as much as you've given in doing it? You know, you're touching a nerve, because I think as I get older, and this has been you know, for almost 40 years, you know, it's no question you get so much more out of it. We get so much more back than we give. And, and I think that sounds trite, but in my world, I mean, just, just seeing that picture, which I didn't know which pictures were coming up, by the way, I, you know, it just, you know, 
We loved that man. He was as complicated and irritating and as irascible as you could imagine. But we knew him for years and, you know, grew to really love him. But he, you know, this is a picture that happened in time and I will tell you about where it was. But um, he just, we looked forward to seeing him. Whenever we saw him, he made our lives better. So, but he was complicated. <laughs> are you complicated? Oh, I think they've taught me I'm way more complicated. I used to think I was simple, you know. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think I'm complicated. Ask my friends who are here in the front row. <laughs> so, so let's go to the middle picture now. And I, and, and I appreciate you bearing with me because I'm building, right? Mm -hmm. Because Anita talks about Boston is home because of the things, in part, that it gave her, her career, her marriage, mm -hmm. her family. Yeah. Um, and you are talking about 40 years of serving the homeless. You didn't set out to do what you were assigned to do a clinic for one year. You've encountered people who you've come to love, who have given you so much more than you gave them. You've stayed in a space of encounter. We're looking at this picture now of you with someone who's sleeping in a park, talking to them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how does this work make Boston uniquely your home? And did your home ever make you angry? Wow. Uh, you know, I listen to you all the time on the radio, Tiziana, and now I realize <laughs> why you're so good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know, if I, uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put this all together as I'm thinking out loud, but if I were to say what, where I feel most at home in Boston, it's probably Boston after dark, where I've had, you know, you may know that Pine Street Inn has a van that goes out every night from nine at night till five in the morning. Think of that, every single night of the year. And it's um, managed and run by these remarkable human beings. So I think of the real heroes in the story of my life anyway. Um, <clears throat> and they know everybody outside since they, they go out all night and they bring soup and sandwiches and blankets. <clears throat> um, not good soup and not good sandwiches, but but we bring them out and they're valuable. Um, but I've been able to ride in that van, at least up until COVID, I was riding on it two nights a week for years and years. Got to know everybody outside, which was a huge privilege. And you don't get to do that in many places. I got to know these phenomenal workers who were out every night. But then I could you know, go out in the van at night and basically know by name everybody we ran into. And talk about a privilege, you know, that was great. And so, for example, like, you know, this was one night out in the van, you know, and I know the man that's under the blankets here really well. I was really worried about, he had just come out of the hospital, I was really worried about him. But it was kind of like you felt, I felt, most at home. You know, we knew, I used to see the kindness of the police toward people that you wouldn't see during the daytime, the kindness of the MBT, MBTA folks who would let people stay in the subways, and then just passers by who were incredibly nice and kind. So I started to see, after dark, the side of Boston that made me feel like I love this city. It's really, really amazing. And to this day, I still think that's where I, you know, that's where I would say I feel most at home when I think of Boston. You know, I don't know that there were many who would expect you to say that in the darkest of night, it was the kindness and tenderness of the city that made it feel like yeah. home. It did. And think about it, because it's, you know, we're out and it can be a really cold night or real, uh, the rain can be just pouring. And, the, and kindness oozes out in those settings and it just becomes, you just feel, you feel it particularly powerfully. And it's, you know, it's as much as just giving somebody a package of crackers, you know, and it's... It's a, it's a bond. So I, you know, when I think back, I realize how lucky could I have been. I could, any other city, I would never have been able to do something like this. So thanks to Boston and the people that let me do that. <laughs> so you've said now that um, during COVID, uh, when you couldn't be there because of illness that you had <clears throat> that made you too vulnerable uh, to the illness, one of the things that you had to grapple with was, my words, not yours, you've done your job so well that the work could go on without you. Are you finding new ways to fall in love with your city when maybe these encounters aren't your first point of contact with the city now as much? Are you thinking ahead to that? Uh, <laughs> yes. So uh, let, me, I, let me paraphrase what you said a little bit. So what I found in uh, so I'd got, you know, I, I was 72 when COVID hit, yep. you know, and I was 
you know, never backed out of anything. I was always first in the, and I, you know, was on these medicines that made my, my immune system not work. So I had to like, and we had a kindergartner at home, think of that. And I had all these other responsibilities I hadn't thought about before. So I actually stayed back and, and did much more administrative stuff during that and let everybody else run into the front lines, feeling intensely guilty and intense, intensely like I'm letting everybody down. And um, what, we le- what I learned initially to my horror is that I was entirely redundant in my own program. You know? <laughs> Nobody noticed I was gone, and I thought I was absolutely necessary. Um, and then it, was, it evolved. I let it evolve slowly into, well, this is a good sign. Maybe, maybe it's something is telling me that you know, there's another, it's, it's time to let another generation take over. And then, of course, the fear of who am I if I don't do this, and then what do you do? Yeah. So. And, and I'm cheating. I'm taking 30 extra seconds. So mm. what's your next love affair with the city? Um, well, you know, I, I, first of all, my, I, the next love affair, I think, is just beginning to, to, to realize how valuable all of that has been. And so I now know lots of people in all sorts of areas. We have a 10-year-old who adores the aquarium, <laughs> um, which I used to hang out outside of all night long. Um, and this city is remarkable. There's amazing people, all sorts of things to do. And through the eyes of a 10-year-old, now I'm starting to realize it's magnificent. This city is truly magnificent and full of amazingly wonderful people. So I'm excited. I'm thrilled to be here and feel like it's a second home now. Wonderful. Dr. Jim O'Connell, thanks so much. Oh, Deanna, thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Kimaya Diggs is coming to the stage. Boston's bursting with creative talent. And every year, our arts and culture team introduces us to 10 local makers. These are artists of color who are on the rise. We had more than 300 nominees for the 2023 group. And Kimaya easily rose into the top 10. Uh, She's going to play for us tonight. Welcome back. Thank you. It's great to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. So um, I'm going to ask you one question, and then we're going to hear two songs from you. And, I, you know, I, can we hear Boston in your music? I think so. Um, I live in Western Mass now, but my family's roots are in Boston and outside of Boston. Um, I'm the grandchild of a feisty gal from Quincy and an Indian immigrant. Um, who met when my great-grandfather was hosting medical and dental students um, for summers when they came here for internships. Um, My grandparents adopted 10 children, um, so I have so many aunts and uncles from around the world. Um, And to me, my Boston experience is a multicultural experience inherently, um, and I think that comes through in my music. Wonderful. Will you introduce us to your songs as you sing them? Sure. Thank you. As my friend Lysander says, we tune because we care. (laughs) The song is called Bloom. (laughs) Tall as grass, narrow as a tree. This has always been a part of me. Blue as summer sky doesn't take a lot to get a girl like me to cry. I've been under stress and I have found the folding in has been what feels the best Bound up at the root Try to tell in lies when I can't bear to tell the truth I've been waiting, waiting to balloon I've been waiting, waiting to bloom. I've been waiting, waiting to bloom. Waiting to bloom. I went a 
underground I wish you were I'd be found Dried out as the dust Desiccated from the energy it takes to trust I've been waiting, waiting to bloom I've been waiting, waiting to bloom oh, I've been waiting, waiting to bloom Waiting to bloom Boston in my music is I had a really my personal New Year's Day, a life-saving, voice-saving vocal surgery at the MGH Voice Center five years ago. <laughs> so you can really hear you can really hear that Boston in my music. Um, about three years ago, I started this song. I'm going to try out a new song. This is going to be the first time I'm playing it in front of people. Um, please hold the negative feedback. Keep it to yourself. Um, but I started this song three years ago um, when my mom was in a health decline, um, and I started to imagine or to wonder if there would be enough of me left after she died. And she died on Mother's Day 2021, and I just haven't been able to work on the song at all until about a month ago. So it just recently got finished. Daylight, I still fight my sleep trying to stay in my dreams with you. Hold on, I'm pretty sure I started it in the wrong key. Okay, we're gonna edit it this. Yeah. There we go. Daylight, I still fight my sleep trying to stay in my dreams with you. I see the future, you ask me, are you sure I always do? I've been prepping every way I can You remember how I held your hand Will there be enough of me when you're gone? Do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? Oh, do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? Do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? Oh, do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? Daylight, I still fight my sleep trying to stay in my dreams with you. Head on the pillow, your eyes on the wind while I write this song. I can't think of all the words to say, but I try to say them anyway. Will there be enough of me when you're gone? Do I want to give it all? 
What's it worth to you? Oh, what do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? Do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? Oh, what do I want to give it all? What's it worth to you? The fall, I know, is hard. I know, it's hard. I know, it's hard. But don't give up that daylight. Daylight. What was your name? My name? Kimaya. No, no. My mom's name? <laughs> yeah. My mom's name was Andrew So Parker Diggs. And what's one thing you'd like us to know about her? One thing I'd like you to know about her. Oh man, she won the Miss India New England beauty pageant when she was 16. <laughs> That's a little known fact. She was much more dramatic than me, and I'm pretty dramatic. <laughs> yeah, she was a great, she was a great person. So everybody in this room who's ever mothered anybody in any way that you see yourself as having mothered, I want you to give Kimaya a bit of a blessing and a send off now as we send her off stage. Join me Thank you. in thanking Kimaya. So Anna Sortoon is going to come to the stage now. She is an award-winning chef, a restaurateur, a cookbook author. She opened her first restaurant, Oleana, in Cambridge in 2001, and is also a partner at Sofra Bakery in Cambridge, soon to open a new location in Boston, and Sarma in Somerville. Welcome. Thank you. Um, we're going to do a little, you're going to do a little demonstration, and I'm going to stand there and try not to drool in just a minute. But before we do that, um, I'm, <laughs> so Anita has got me curbing my questions of things like, what does Boston taste like? Because I think you might go, no, <laughs> Boston tastes like many things. But give me a few of the flavors of Boston in your mind when you close your eyes. Well, I don't know if it's going to make sense to everybody else, but I always think of um, what we grow here first and what, you know, things taste like from the ground, but also the water as well, um, and what's around us. Um, the only thing I'm not a huge fan of is the cranberry thing in, in Boston. I'm oh, sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I know, but it's from, from a, a cook's point of view, it's the only ingredient that you need to just cover in sugar to make it, um, I don't know, to make people like it. It's, it's, it's pretty tart. Yeah. <laughs> You're really committed to cooking local uh, cooking seasonal, creating dishes that are really rooted in our land. Where does that come from for you? Uh, well, I've learned everything I know about the land in New England from my husband who is here, who farms the land in New England, and he's taught me so much about oh, not just growing stuff, but 
like the challenges of growing stuff and and how um, there's there's beauty and it changes every year. Um, even even the bad things are beautiful, like bugs and disease and too much rain. Um, there's always some some silver lining to something. Um, Mother Nature is pretty cool, um, but yeah, I think. Um, when I think of, you know, obviously people talk about lobster and baked beans here and it Parker House rolls and um, things. Chocolate chip cookies, by the way. <laughs> but I think, you know, there was so much more. I, I always remember my daughter when she did the, uh, at school she had a colonial festival, right? And um, I'm sorry if I'm embarrassed you, Sienna. This is a... a <laughs> A story that I'll never forget, but I, I went to the school to cook for the Colonial Festival, and I didn't really know um, what I was supposed to do, but of course I showed up with um, Doc, and you know, this was like, what were you in the third grade or something like that? Um, Doc, and um, you know, I did like a, a puree of parsnips with um, lots of <laughs> Anyhow, I showed up with food that third graders had never seen before. And, it's, of course, I was pacing up and down the hallway going, what have I done? I, oh, my God, I brought duck to the Colonial Festival. <laughs> but I, I brought duck to the Colonial Festival because in the Plymouth Plantation, um, the Native Americans were eating duck. They weren't eating turkey, and they were eating duck. And duck is so delicious, so... Why wouldn't I cook duck for third graders? <laughs> Did any of the third graders like the duck? They all loved it. They came back. It was the parents that were really surprised that their kids <laughs> liked duck, but the, the kids want, ate all the duck. They didn't eat any of the squash that had all the maple syrup and, right. and coconut milk in it. So were you like, boom, <laughs> right? Duck and parsnips in the third grade. Well, I just thought it was really cool because I think, um, again, it's what, it's what we have. It's not always what we th think it is, but... When we look around at what's growing here and what um, what resources we have, they're they're amazing. So, uh, do you want to cook? Do you want to prepare something? Sure. You if want to take us duck. over to the if table. Not duck. <laughs> <laughs> take us over to the table. Sure. And I think you've got a lavalier mic on, right? I do. It's Great. on, right? Yeah. Okay. So I'm. This is in honor of the green garlic, which comes up this time of year. This is like um, garlic is a symbolic thing for us at the farm because. It's the last thing that um, my husband plants in November that sort of signifies, he plants the good garlic, the, the heads of garlic that we know. Each clove goes in, it sort of symbolizes his commitment to growing the next year because he's gonna put it in the ground and, and in the springtime, this is what's gonna come up. So it's a, you know, a long shoot with some green at the top, but it, it doesn't look like what you think about when you think about buying garlic at the store. Exactly, so this, this Form, this head hasn't formed yet, but the farmer really has to get this to be nice and fat. So he has to thin out the garlic. So he's got to pick some of this um, garlic now so that there's room in the ground for these bulbs to get really big. So and you fat. literally have to thin it out. Yeah. Okay. So this just tastes like really sweet, um, tender garlic. It's delicious. And it's sauteed. You know, you just saute it. I don't know if you guys can see this in a yes, camera. Yes, so we have an yeah. overhead camera coming down on the table. So yeah. and you can see there what they're seeing. Do you see in that screen on the yeah. stage? Yeah, so, so basically this is the green garlic. It looks just like scallions. You chop it, it up, you cook it in, in olive oil nice and slowly until it gets really soft. And this is, uh, I'm going to make a dip called mahamara, which is a uh, uh, Middle Eastern... <laughs> Uh, red pepper and walnut puree. This one's going to be a green version of that. It's a pistachio, green garlic, um, and uh, green chili dip. So Let me just say as you're preparing this, I'm standing over the table and there are these herbs. I want to crawl into the middle of the table. It smells so good. So what are the ingredients that you have here? So pistachios um, are the first thing that goes in. And then we have spices like cumin, and this mm -hmm. is a dried green chili and coriander spice that goes in it. And then a ton of herbs and um, some green onions. The roasted uh, green pepper, which we just roast until you can see the skin just peels right yeah, off. Peels right off. And that's a whole pepper. Yep, that's a whole green pepper and poblano pepper. And roasted then, the same way. Exactly. And then we just pull the skin off. And this is what they look like all skinned. It's super easy to do. People usually tend to buy these jarred, but it's really easy to just roast it until... In the oven? In the oven. Okay. Yeah. 
just like that, and no, no necess it's not necessary to stuff them in a plastic bag like everyone tells you to do. Just let them sit, and the skin will just pull right off. And then um, we make it kind of tart and acidic with something called pomegranate molasses, which mm -hmm. is typical in any kind of mahamra. So uh, I usually start with a food processor and the nuts, and I usually add the salt at this stage because it grinds, it helps grind the pistachio a little bit. It's more a coarse evenly. salt, it looks like. It's a little kosher salt, okay. yeah. And then I'm going to add my spices, cumin, and this um, dried coriander and dried chili spice that we use called, we call it shabazi. And it's, um, we just name a lot of our spices. And we're going to get, and make some noise. So you use, you're using a food processor here. We're using a food processor, and we're going to grind the nuts, um, give them sort of a head start. The salt um, makes them grind more evenly. And then we're going to start to add all of our ingredients, which um, are the peppers. And these have been just roasted and peeled, and nothing else has been done to them. Um, an equal part of poblano, not a super spicy chili, um, but a really dark, deep chili, which is why I like them. And then lots of herbs. Um, we use parsley, mint, and then the green onions. And this is essential. And mint is there's, um, if anyone has a garden, it's going crazy right now. So it's a perfect time for it. And then, of course, our star, the green garlic, because Mahamra always has a lot of uh, garlic in it. Is the green garlic very powerful? Do you need to be mm. careful how much you use? Or can you just kind of go to town with the green garlic? You can really go to town with it at this stage. It's really young and sweet. Yeah, okay. it's not it's not strong like the cured stuff. Um, not as concentrated. So we're going to blend again. And then we're gonna, here we go for the noise. Uh oh. I know it. That's a good sound. That's a actually. good thing? Yeah. Because it feels like it's slowing down a little there. I know. It's always, cooking is so much, um, people always think it's just tasting and touching and feeling, but it's, it's listening. And sound, there's always some really, this is a good noise. You can actually hear it moving. But we're going to grind it for a second until it starts to be form almost like a pesto in a way. Okay. I, I do want to note, I, I, I like the tasting part. You said. <laughs> <laughs> we'll for whatever sure, it's worth. <laughs> we'll make sure you can help oh me. Oh my up. gosh, you took the top off and the <laughs> mint just came right? out of that so beautifully. And I, oft yeah. Oftentimes, like it, it'll remind you when you're making mahamra, it's like either a red or a green pesto. Traditionally, it's like a red color, but, um, but it is very much like a pesto. So it should, and if you're using fresh stuff, that's, that's the whole idea, right? It just should pop. Right, yeah. and I, and I I am going to ask a question that is either a great great question or I just humiliated myself. <laughs> but since I don't grow vegetables or herbs at home because of the rabbits, all of these things essentially I could grow so far that I could grow at home or grown locally. There's nothing here besides maybe the herbs that had to be imported. Pistachios. Pistachios. Thank you. Pistachios. Somebody in the audience gave me the assist. They're like, mm -mm, the pistachios. Yeah, yeah. Our, our nuts, uh, we, don't have, we don't have nuts here. Yeah. yeah, but other than that, I forgot about the pistachios. Other yeah. than that, this could come from a garden. Absolutely. Great. Absolutely. Okay. And you, you can could... deal with importing the pistachios from now, somewhere else. I brought breadcrumbs with me because sometimes if people's peppers are more watery, the breadcrumb can kind of thicken it up into a, a good consistency. But you can't make, this is also another thing that's not New England, but olive oil, it's an essential um, ingredient to make anything taste Mediterranean. You have to have olive oil. Plus, I consider it a spice. It has so much nuance, flavor, um, vegetal texture to it. It's, it's an important ingredient. My understanding is you take your olive oil very seriously. Very seriously, yes. Yeah. We, we couldn't live without it. We couldn't. And then um, pomegranate molasses, which is like you know balsamic vinegar or something. It, it gives dish uh, the dish a brightness and acidity, which mm -hmm. is part of uh, balancing the the flavor. And that's it. All and right. This is it. And then you can kind of adjust the creaminess by and the thickness too by either adding more olive oil. And since it's good for you, I usually add a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 
And do you prefer it very creamy, a little less creamy? What do you recommend? I love it a little bit creamy um, with just with texture of the nuts in it. Okay. Um, and I also, Mahamara should be spicy. Okay. So that's really what we're looking for is a nice balance of like acidic, spicy, creamy, and a little bit of texture left from the nuts. But you should be able to, to drag or to dip a piece of bread into it. Um, and again, because it's good for you, a little bit more olive oil. So you put it in a bowl. At the, <laughs> the, it, it, you put it in a bowl. You made a nice little indentation, and then you drizzled plenty more olive oil and some of the pomegranate molasses in there. And now we've just got this beautiful. And it's always it's always good to make a little gravy well in something to hold a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing. And, and what is this bread? This is a, a za'atar bread. It's um, it's made with a fresh wheat that is um, milled in Boston in Lynn, Massachusetts, One Mighty Mill. Um, and we put za'atar on top of it, which is a, a wild herb and, and sesame seed mixture. And it's really delicious with mahamara. All right. So want to try it? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I would oh. have knocked you over and tried it we anyway. We get to break I'm bread. Gonna, we okay. get to break bread. Cheers. <laughs> so we're going to taste this and make the entire audience jealous now. Now, um, you taste first. Okay. Because somebody should be talking while someone else is chewing. It's a rule of radio, okay. which is what I usually do. So obviously it's a recipe you're familiar with, but uh, as you chew, I want you to think about sort of what, what flavor this time pops out for you, and does a different flavor pop out each time? Like when you, when you make a dish a dozen times, is it a little different for you every time? Always. So Always. talk about that a little so that I can taste. One reason, I'm not very good at following recipes, so that's why it tastes um, um, a little different. It was so... I don't know, one day is a little different from the other, but also the ingredients have nuances too, right? So it depends where the pistachios are from. It, it depends what kind of olive oil I use. It depends if it's green garlic or regular garlic. It depends if it's mint versus parsley. Um, but I think that's what cooking's all about. It should never be that precise. Baking should always be precise. Cooking should, I've made that mistake. That's why I can't bake is I just can't follow the rules close enough and it, nothing ever comes out. I can't change my mind while I'm baking. It has to always be very exact. It's a science, but cooking is a, is a feeling and, uh, and it should change all the time. And you should never make the same carrot soup all your life. You should change it um, a couple times at least. And I think that's what I love about cooking and also the growing season throughout the year in New England too. And it kind of feels like our city doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Anna Sortoon, thank you so thank much. Thank you very Appreciate much. It. Appreciate it. Appreciate Please it. join me. I'm taking more. Anna, thank you. <laughs> I'm taking one more bite. <laughs> While I walk back to my seat. And I'm going to read you a few more of these. Uh, when did Boston feel like home to you? I got a kick out of this one. When I stopped going to Cleveland to see my dentist. <laughs> I liked that one a lot. Uh, we had another blizzard of 78 here. I loved this one. When our neighbors started saving parking for us. Yeah, ex right? Right, exactly. Uh, and this one, I had to save this one. When I called out six sick after the 86 Red Sox loss. That's when Boston felt like home. Right. All right, Catherine, would you like to come up? Wonderful. Please join me in inviting Catherine T. Morris to the stage. Catherine is the founder and executive director of BAMS Fest, that is the Boston Art and Music Soul Fest, and the director of arts and culture for the Boston Foundation. She's a convener of people and ideas, and she's got vision for what Boston can be. I failed to have the vision to finish my last bite of bread. <laughs> Before I brought you up here, so I'm just gonna put that Enjoy. right there. Enjoy. Welcome. You gonna take a taste afterward? Absolutely. Can I yeah. have the whole thing? Actually, do you, okay. do you want to do you want to take a taste? No, no, no. We're, we're yeah. in front of a lot. I can't I do that. Okay, yet. I tell you, it's very good. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, I, I want to know so much about you. Oh, I'm a mystery. But I want to start by asking you what has struck you most about what you've heard so far. Wow, um, home is different for everyone. But what I appreciate is the connectivity of our stories and how. We've either given life to our city or it's given life back to us. Yeah, yeah. And I just appreciate that. It makes me very proud as a Bostonian. I love that. And I think that feeds 
beautifully into the first picture that I want to put uh -oh. up Be careful. of you um, at, at BAMS Fest. And I think we've, we've got, actually, that's the second one. I want to go to the one with Catherine standing on the stage alone. We're going to come to this because it's a fantastic story. And here's the reason I picked this. Oh, boy. It's, it's joy. <laughs> it is joy. It's joy. And I want to lean into all of the things that are the joy of BAMS Fest and why you wanted to bring the joy of the music and the art and the culture mm -hmm. of BAMS Fest to the city. Why? Well, <clears throat> I, oh, first of all, born and raised, I love my city. I hate my city. I love all the things with it. Um, and it, it's, it's given me so much expression in my childhood of just being able to be a child. And so as I grew up as an adult, um, I wanted to make sure that anything that I participated in uh, was asked to be a part of. Um, I wanted to lend my imagination because I was allowed to have that growing up. And for me, that means that when I meet someone for the first time, I hug everybody. I don't know when I'm gonna see you again. And we know that energy transfers. So, uh, Joy for me and the, and the things that I do is um, being is hard, but when you're able to engage with energy, good spirit, a story, laughter, I've always wanted to keep that going in any space that I take up or take the hinges off the door for others. And so that's, that's what joy is for me. That's why I bring it to this festival. It is about... We are here together. You have permission to be yourself. Go frolic amongst the grass. Ground yourself in Mother Nature. Meet someone you haven't before. And tell them your story. That's how the earth rotates. All that energy moving. Uh, does BAMS Fest, when you started it, were you taking the hinges off the door? I was told no, it could never happen. Boston could never do that. And in true underdog uh, attitude, I remember saying to certain individuals in the city, I want to see you in a couple of years. I want to make this thing happen. And, and what about it did they say couldn't happen? I mean, Boston calling happened. I was dreaming too big. How dare I take up space? How dare I imagine... Um, bringing art into a green space? How dare I uh, um, center the arts versus something else? Like sports, I love sports, but the arts mean so much to me. Um, and I love being told no. Oh, that gives me all the energy I need to prove people wrong. Um, but for me, it was very important to show that Boston has much more to offer. Um, outside of all the things we're known for, but the arts for me just felt like uh, it was being overlooked constantly, and I wanted to show that it can exist, and it, it can exist everywhere across our city. And does. It wasn't like you made art happen. You were right. <laughs> featuring art that was in every nook and cranny and corner yes. of the city. Absolutely. I had to. Um, I got tired of hearing all of my creative friends uh, complain and become frustrated about there was just not enough opportunity. And after so much complaining, I'm like, well, so let's just do something about it. Um, and so I just did and started with four artists. I was working at MIT, a graveyard shift, my favorite shift. And I told them the vision and they said yes. And I put $22,000 of my personal money into supporting those artists. And now we're close to 800 artists now. You're not proud of that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Who student loans. Uh. <laughs> I want to bring up now the next picture. And you actually brought yes. this with you. Amy's going to bring it up here now. And I, I had, you know, I've got the caption and I, but... You brought it, you tell it. Oh, okay. Um, so you the, want me to hold it for you yes, while please. you're my, here. My I'm going to put my mic down. Tired. Um, so what's great about producing a festival is you never know when someone's going to give you a call and say, hey, I have a great idea that I think would align. 
And I got the strangest email from the United States Postal Service <laughs> that they wanted to do something special at our festival, but they wouldn't tell me exactly what it was until the day of. They just said, we're going to show up with a stand. Um, and then I was told uh, by this gentleman uh, that's off to my left on this photo um, that we're going to unveil the Marvin Gaye Forever Stamp at Bands Festival. And I cussed. I'm not going to tell you what I said, but I was so taken aback because I asked, well, who's the artist? Kadir Nelson for The New Yorker. And when uh, the stamp was unveiled, um, the audience gasped because they had never seen one um, the opportunity to see this kind of art show up on our stage, but also look at the Postal Service a little differently now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was a very pivotal moment because for me it was that arts is everywhere, even your local postal office. <laughs> So for all those that get stamps and choose, thank you. You are supporting an artist somewhere. Thank you very much. And this was June 22nd, 2019. Yes, second yeah. year, perfect weather, because the first year it rained all day. <laughs> so the uh, musical artistic ancestors are with us 2019. So take us on a lightning tour um, to three places that we can see, hear, experience art that you love, Ooh. whether it's a mural or it's a place to hear music or it's a place to experience dance or take us a few places for art. Wow, we're going to be here all night. Um, we do not have all night. <laughs> I know we don't. I know we don't. <laughs> um, the first place for me is Wally's on Mass Ave. Um, iconic place for jazz, but also iconic place to just bring community. Um, you don't get to have the barriers of three feet. You actually have to bud with somebody, <laughs> yeah. right? You're feeling what they're feeling. You're feeling the wavelength of energy. I so, think it, it may be the oldest continuously running jazz club in the city now. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. So, so Wallace is the first place. Um, the second place for me is the Hat Shell, um, one of the most iconic world stages uh, to date. Um, and... Uh, so many amazing iconic performances, but also the way in which an outdoor space can encompass nature. Um, you get uh, folks that are coming off the water, someone who's running with their dog, someone wants to play frisbee. You just get all this intersectional uh, communication and stories that are happening in front of a space. Uh, the other place I would probably say for me um, is absolutely Franklin Park. Has to be. It's, it's, it is the heartbeat of our city. Um, and you can experience everything there. Um, and so for those that walk it, run it, you know, bring their dog, whatever the case is, that's home base for me. Is there an artist or a, an artwork or an art experience that you haven't yet brought to BAMS Fest that is what? <laughs> that's a loaded question. <laughs> wow. Um, for those that love uh, the former group Outcast, um, Andre 3000, I would love to bring to the city of Boston and play at Franklin Park. That would be the dream. All right. Let's all work with you thank to you. help make that a reality. <laughs> Catherine G. Morris, thank you so much Absolutely. for being with You should go taste some food. There you go. It's been such a pleasure to be a little bit of a guide for you as we've heard some of these wonderful stories and people's experiences of Boston. Um, really, this has been rooted in the work of Cognoscenti. And so now I really would like to turn the mic over to Chloe Axelson to bring us to the end of the evening. I'm, I'm not going to stand up here by myself, so I'd like our guests, please, to join me on stage.
All people in the back. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I think home is a universal concept. And it means wildly different things to different people. And that's what I really wanted to explore. I wanted to explore that idea tonight. And I think, and also what it means in Boston. And I think we did that tonight, which is pretty great. Um, whether it's... Whether it's food, or art, or care, or imagination, or family, or music, uh, I really cannot fathom working with a smarter or kinder group of people than is here right now. So again, thank you to Jim, Catherine, Anita, Anna, and Kamaya. Thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your perspectives. Clap, everybody. I also want to thank uh, Tiziana over there for expertly guiding us through this conversation and making it look so damn easy. I want to thank Margaret Lowe for being just a steadfast supporter of COG and of me. Thank you, Margaret. And Vicki Spruill in the New England Aquarium, thank you for being our generous sponsor tonight. My kids are going to be so excited when they hear that I, heard, that I hung out with the person who's in charge of Myrtle the turtle. <laughs> For serious, they are, they are obsessed. There's one final thing I want to do before we go, um, because I think if you enjoyed the conversation this evening, you are going to love Cog's newsletter. For real, seriously. Uh, it's every bit as eclectic and interesting and human as what we did tonight. It arrives on Sunday mornings. It includes our best stories of the week and usually an essay by me or one of my co-editors. And if you're subscribed already, thank you very much. Send it to seven friends. Like, keep, keep it going. But if not, we have a, we have a QR code right there. And uh, you can just do this right, get out your phone, do it right now, and sign up and get on the list. I'll wait. Margaret tells me this is like the perfect way to drink your morning coffee on Sundays. Right, Margaret? <laughs> all right. Everybody in? Okay. That's all I got. So thank you all. Good night. See you soon.